Episode 3, Visualizing Data. In your future career as a chemical engineer, you might be tasked with presenting results or data from a calculation or an experiment. You have plenty of options for ways to display this data. There is the data table, which I think you will agree is not a very effective method for fast and easy communication. Data is much more easily interpreted by expressing it visually, such as in a plot. Excel can make plots like this fairly easily. I have to forewarn you though, and I say this as an avid Excel user, that there are better software options for plotting data for professional purposes. Many of the Excel defaults, quite frankly, look horrible. That said, I will show you how to make your plots look nice. It just takes a little bit of work. Excel is also great if you just want a quick look at your data for your own purposes. The first step is to decide which type of plot you want to make. Two examples from everyday life are pie charts and bar charts. A pie chart is very good for showing the parts of a whole, but quite honestly you won't see this in engineering very often. The bar chart is good when you want to show the dependence of a dependent variable on an independent variable, if there is no logical order of the independent variable. You will sometimes see bar charts in engineering. And my favorite part about pie charts and bar charts is that you can make a pie chart of your favorite bars and a bar chart of your favorite pies. In engineering, your independent variable, which goes on the x-axis, oftentimes is numerical. And that means that there is a logical order. And for plots of this type, a line chart is best. However, in Excel, you're going to want to choose the scatter plot, which is functionally the same thing as a line plot, but this choice will give you more freedom over the design options. So let's get started. In Excel, you want to make sure that your data is well organized. This means having a column for your independent and your dependent variables. I like to have my independent variable, which will ultimately go on the x-axis, furthest to the left, and the dependent variables to the right. To see these various possibilities within Excel, click the Insert tab, and from there you can see the various options that you have. The scatter plot is going to be all the way at the bottom to the right. Within the scatter plot tab, you still have five options. Here's how to choose which one based on the data that you have. If you have actual data points from experiments, you should include the data markers. On the left has no data markers, on the right has actual data points. In contrast, if you're showing a mathematical model, in other words an equation, you should not include data markers. So this plot actually has multiple data series plotted superimposed on the same plot. The circles and the squares are the actual data points that are not connected with the line, and the red line is a separate equation that is intended to describe the data. Whatever you do, never connect your data points with a smooth line or just show a smooth line. So even though this one looks the most aesthetically pleasing, you don't want to do this because this implies that you modeled your data and that the curviness is real and described by your mathematical model. To create your plot, start by highlighting your data. If you highlight two columns, Excel will interpret the left column to be your x-axis and the right column to be your y-axis. Here again, you can cycle through and see your various options. Because the x-axis is time in this instance, and therefore connected, it's permissible to connect data points with a straight line in between them. Unfortunately, because of how I labeled my time axis, Excel is interpreting this as a string rather than a value. And you want to make sure that your data is values instead of strings. So here I'm just going to make a new column where I just have the number such that there's a value. And then a quick, easy way to change your data series is you can simply click on the data series and then drag the purple and the blue rectangles to be the data that you want to portray. To add more data to the plot, right-click on the plot and click Select Data, and then Add. You can add more data series simply by filling in what you intend the name of the data series to be with the range of series X values and series Y values in the appropriate places. So now I'm going to go through and do this for wafers 2, 3, and 4 and change the name for my first data series. Once again, if you make a mistake, you can click on the data series and then drag to rearrange the data that you're showing. The purple rectangle is the X axis values and the blue rectangle is the Y axis values. With the plot made, now we can focus on making it look pretty. First, let's start by focusing in on the chart title. The default chart title is not very informative, just chart title. 
Whether or not to have a chart title will depend on what publication you are publishing your graphic, and whether or not you will also have a figure caption. If there is no figure caption, your chart title should describe what actually it is that you are plotting. But because this is just an informative video, I will choose to leave off the chart title. Next, let's talk about grid lines. These are a matter of personal preference, but to me, I like to omit the grid lines unless I expect my reader to need to use my grid lines to look up specific values on my plot. I can increase the number of grid lines if this is my intention by right-clicking on the axis. You have to right-click on both the X and the Y axis and say add minor grid lines. You could change the color of the grid lines if you like, but I caution you against making the grid lines too dark because this can make your graph extremely hard to read. On the topic of changing colors, you can change the axes to be darker and bolder. This is a matter of personal preference, but I think that a dark, bold axis looks much better than a faint gray axis. You can right-click on the axis and under Outline, change the color to flat black, and also change the line thickness to whichever thickness you desire. You can make the dark black border go all the way around by formatting the entire chart area and clicking outline and making the weight of the line the same thickness as the axis. Next, we need to add axis titles, also known as axis labels. Every chart needs these. Click on the green plus sign on the upper right hand corner in order to add them. After you've added them, you can use a text editor to type in whatever your axis title is. Make sure that if it's a numerical measurement that you also include the unit. You can also change the font size and the font type. Typically, I like to use Times New Roman, but you can choose whatever you like, as long as it's legible and professional. A general guideline is that your fonts should be consistent. So once you've decided on a font, you should also make sure that your axis numbers are in a similar font with a similar size. It takes a few minutes to do this, but this is time well spent. After you change the font, you might want to change the actual numbers that are on your axis. To do this, right-click the axis and select Format Axis. Axis bounds will set the minimum and the maximum number that appear on the axis. While units, you can change the numbers that appear in between. So the major unit will give you a number every time, and a minor unit will give you a grid line or a tick mark. Speaking of tick marks, these can help your reader quickly interpret your axis. Under axis options and the little chart icon, there's a section called tick marks, where you can choose to include major tick marks or minor tick marks. Personally, I like to do cross-type tick marks for the major units and inside tick marks for the minor units. And I like to do that on both X and Y axes. Up next is the plot legend. Once again, click on the green check mark in the upper right hand corner and go down to legend. And here you can display the names of the data series that you've defined under set data. This is very helpful for displaying what the individual data series are referring to. The default location for the plot legend is on the right hand side, but as you can see right now, I prefer to put it inside the plot in an area where it's not covering any of the data. I also like to make sure that my background is white and I put a border around the legend such that it stands out nicely. Finally, I'll discuss how to adjust the colors of your data series. As you can tell, the Excel defaults are kind of cartoonish and not very professional looking. Right click the data series that you want to adjust and say format data series all the way at the bottom. Then click on the paint icon in the right hand window. From there you can adjust the line color and line thickness. One consideration that you want to be sure to make when you're choosing a color scheme is that you want to be sensitive to color blindness. So avoid putting red and green in the same plot. Even though I break that rule later on in the final version of this plot, 
I make up for it by building redundancy into my plot as well. So you'll see that as I'm going through and making the markers different shapes, I'm adding another layer of a way that a reader could differentiate between the data series. So for example, the red line is marked with squares for data points, the green line is marked with diamonds for data points, and I'll also have circles and triangles there as well. And here you have it, the final finished product that you can be proud to submit to your supervisor or to your professor. One potential improvement that you can make to this plot, since all four data series are measuring the same thing just in different experiments, is instead of reporting each one separately, you could report just one data point, and you can make that the average, and then have error bars to denote what the standard deviation is. That will be the subject of the next episode of Excel for Chemical Engineers.